I do want to thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me. I found it very, very stimulating. It's actually quite fun to listen to very good lectures in areas that you don't know much about the subject matter. And it's just stimulating. And I hope that works for you. Uh, most of you don't do mouse imaging. You probably thought it was the exclusive domain of Walt Disney. Uh, but I hope there are some crossover things that might be of interest to uh, things that have been talked about in this meeting. Before I start, I'd like to make a, a, a general observation on spatial dimensions. Uh, I've been listening here, and I'm hearing space get used in two very distinct ways. And I think it may be useful to clarify those in terms of what we're talking about. And it certainly sets up the context for anatomical imaging, which has a different set of problems in some ways. We all got huge data sets. We all have relationships among those data sets. And I think what VISB is encouraging us to do is think about creative ways to communicate those relationships using visual formats. And if you just start with the visual space, that's usually two dimensions, and you have no other priors, you can paint in that space any way you want. And we've seen all kinds of things done in there. There are hairballs and, God forbid, pie, uh, pie plots. Uh, there are networks, there are circles, there are circles of the tree of life, there are fractal trees of life. You have complete freedom with the two spatial dimensions to do anything you want. However, sometimes the data we have comes with a spatial connection associated with it. So sequence data is at least one dimensional. Whenever we've seen sequence data here, it's basically five prime to three prime and everything is laid out and the horizontal direction is actually a given by the data. And you get choices as to what you put in the other files running down the page, but, and you can actually chop it up as somebody suggested and put some things closer to other things, but that begins to compromise the fundamental linear relationship that comes with the data. On uh, Wednesday, Sarah talked to us about maps, which are intrinsically two-dimensional data. They come with two spatial dimensions. Toronto is basically west of Boston, and both of them are north of Florida, which is much, much warmer. And New Zealand, we heard, is uh, much further away in some sense, and possibly even around on the back of the display. Uh, but it's distant in a two-dimensional sort of sense. And we're told this time of year it's even much warmer than where we should have held the meeting. When we get to anatomy, we're into three dimensions. And um, that gets to be a little more problematic. And it's problematic because uh, our data is living in a space that doesn't match the space in which we want to communicate it in three dimensions, or if we put time in and want to look at development, as uh, we've just been shown by Sean, uh, we're really into four dimensions. And so I think the challenges that we have in visualizing anatomy are, first of all, to understand what are the relationships that we want to even find and highlight and communicate. Are we looking for similarities? Are we looking for differences? Are we looking for spatial relationships between things? Are we mostly looking at change? Uh, sometimes it's not clear. Here we're looking at male-female differences in the mouse brain. And then the other challenge that we have once we've decided what we, is we want to communicate is how do we present this information in a way that's consistent with the spatial domains that we've been given, the three dimensions that we've been given. I actually think of the two challenges. The second one is more difficult. And it's more difficult because we don't see in 3D. And so we went, when we get data that's intrinsically three-dimensional, we really have some trouble getting it to represent. What we really look at is 2D. Our retina is a 2D surface. Our computer screen is a 2D surface. They're well-matched. Data goes very well from the computer to the retina. We're not so good at going back the other way. Um, but that, those are fundamentally 2D to 2D transforms. When we think about the world, we think that we live in a three-dimensional world, and we use a variety of tricks to give ourselves a sense of the three-dimensionality of the world. We use parallax. Uh, motion often helps it very much. We use binocular vision, or about 85% of us do. The other 15 can't. Uh, 
Uh, we use the focus length of our eyes to tell us something about distance. We use color and hue. And these are all sort of tricks that give us a sense of what's close and what's far and help us build a three-dimensional uh, view of the world that we're living in. Uh, but we should remind ourselves that even when we're talking about 3D viewing, we're really looking at two-dimensional surfaces embedded in three space. If we really have three-dimensional images, it's like looking at fog. And we can't see fog. You can't both look at something and through something, at least not very far. And so the kind of anatomical data that we have, which is intrinsically three dimensions, is X, Y, Z, and intensity, uh, is simply non-viewable data. As I've said, an 3D anatomy is, in fact, fog. I think one of the cleverest ways of looking at three-dimensional uh, anatomical data has been done by Body Works. I'm sure some of you have seen this. This is a situation where they have peeled away the surface that we normally look at in three space and presented us with some other surfaces. And the reason we don't get lost is they've kept the context of the gross anatomy associated with that. And so when we see something that's a pile of bones like that, we understand where they are and what they're doing because we recognize the anatomical structure. And I think there are actually some very clever ways of taking things apart, keeping enough of the context in place to give us a sense of how to see other layers, but it still doesn't get to the issue of trying to fully see three-dimensionally. It was all by way of an aside, but I think it's an interesting problem, and I think in many ways it makes the three-dimensional imaging and the anatomy more difficult. So I image mice. Why? Um, mice are the preferred mammalian model for genomics. Uh, genes and pathways are very similar to humans. This list you probably all know. They have clinical symptoms of human disease. We have completed gene sequences. Uh, probably most important for what I'm going to say today is we have inbred strains of mice. We have large families of genetically identical uh, SIBs uh, that we can uh, use as baseline experiments. And we certainly have powerful techniques for manipulating the mouse genome. We also have a, an international consortium called the International Knockout Mouse Consortium, which is just finishing off the job of taking all of the 23,000 genes and knocking them out one at a time. That makes 23,000 distinct lines of mice. Uh, this is now 85% complete, should be completed by the end of this year. And it's virtually a useless exercise until we grow those mice up. Most of them now are simply embryonic stem cells in the freezer, and they need to be grown up, and we need to ask, if we knock out each gene in turn, what happens? Uh, this is a very expensive process. There's about $200 million been committed by US and UK and a bit by the by European Union. Canada has a tiny bit uh, to doing this, and that will probably get us through the first 5,000 lines. It's not clear what happens after that. And I've been arguing that one of the things we should be doing when we make these mice is do three-dimensional imaging of them and it, even if we don't use that data totally now, it's a very good archive to go back and mine in the future when we want more detailed information about what genes cause gallbladders to not appear. Another thing we know is that 30% of these uh, 23,000 strains are going to be embryonic lethal, but that we still need to phenotype those because in some ways the embryonic lethal genes are the most critical genes that we want to know in terms of development. The phenotyping question in imaging is really very simple. If this is a wild-type strain of mice, one that we know and love, and this is one with a knockout or a knock-in or a random mutation or any other way changed, then the real question is, is the yellow mouse the same or different than the purple mouse? And we want to know that without getting confused with anatomical differences. It's not important that the front paw of the yellow mouse is down and the purple one is up. We really only want to know about significant anatomical differences between them. Most of the work of doing that uh, has focused on the brain. These are some MR images of most brain. These are the highest resolution ones I've seen so far. They're about 10 microns isotropic resolution. That means the data set for a single mouse brain is tens of gigabytes. 
And if you do tens of gigabytes by 23,000 strains, by 10 mice in each, uh, we're into the scale of big data sets. Not as big as some I've heard here, but still seriously big data sets. And so we need to develop uh, computer techniques for answering the question whether things are the same and different. The images we take are slightly lower resolution. Here are images, three just a slice out of three-dimensional data blocks of genetically identical mice. And we begin by registering them together into a common space. First of all, translations, rotations, and then when we've got as far as we can get with affine transforms, we go nonlinear and do a multi-scale approach and work our way down until we have a deformation field, which is a vector from every voxel in this image, which takes that voxel into its corresponding place in the uh, average atlas. Um, we don't do that just to make a pretty picture in the average atlas. We do that to find homologous points. And it's really very similar to finding homologous points in the genome. A T is homologous to an, uh, any other T, but it's actually the local context that tells you whether this is a real homology or not. And in the same place here, a voxel is equivalent to a voxel, but it's the surrounding voxels and what are happening that tell us whether that's a true correspondence and represents an homologous uh, point. Once we've done that, one of the first things you can ask is, how variable is mouse anatomy if the genetics is kept intact? So this is a point in our uh, atlas. We can ask, where were the individual points that had to move to become part of that atlas, and how far on average did they have to go? And the answer to that is down here. It's 100 microns, a tenth of a millimeter, which was remarkably small. In fact, that's a very interesting question in developmental biology, because if you express that as a percent, the ge geometric locations in the brain along the length of the brain are accurate to about a half a percent. And when you recognize that the cells are variable at about 10 percent, you really do begin to wonder who holds the ruler and what makes that happen. Um, the nice thing about it is that since it's very precise and genetically identical brains are cookie cutter similar, then it's very easy to find different brains when we've made genetic changes. It's just illustrated another way here. Uh, this is an atlas we've made out of three different strains of mice, nine individuals of each. And we've gone to an arbitrary point in the atlas, and that's the atlas point, and we're asking where were the homologous points that ended up registering to that point in the atlas? And what you see is that the strains cluster with about 100 microns uh, root mean square error with respect to each, to themselves, but they're distinguishable from each other quite clearly at a single neuroanatomical point, and that's true over most of the brain. I do like to point out that this is probably the most complicated and undoubtedly the most expensive way to tell a white mouse from a black mouse, <laughs> but it was not what we were about. Well, let's start looking at some genetic changes then. Here are changes in the brain of a mouse which copies an autism spectrum disorder gene, uh, 16P112, uh, and we're looking at several slices through the brain, and the color regions are showing us regions that are different in size in that uh, mutant mouse compared to the reference mouse that it was built on. And we see patterns. We have to do correction for multiple comparisons, which we do with a false discovery rate. And just here's some of the patterns that are associated with that. Here's a comparison in a different gene associated with Rett syndrome, also associated with ASD. Here's the heterozygote distributions, and on the bottom, the same slices now with, homo with the homozygote, and what you see is more significant changes, larger and bolder, but pretty much the same patterns from the het, just more advanced in the homozygote. Here's another representation of an integrin beta-3 uh, mutation. Uh, now we've actually picked out certain regions segmented in the brain of the atlas, and we can ask how much did the size of those regions change? Uh, what's the effect size? We can actually do that for a large number of regions and make a color plot. You don't need to be able to read this. This is just brain anatomy regions. I've looked at lots of your graphs that I can't read the numbers on to, uh, in this talk as well. Here are the three that we pointed out above. And then we can actually do that for a whole series of genes. 
which are related to autism spectrum disorder and have been taken off the human GWAS studies for ASD. So what have we got here? We've come now to a color plot. We have freedom of what we put on the axis. We've collapsed all the spatial information, but this is still a map of neuroanatomical association. And what we're beginning to do is to cluster all of the genes that are implicated in this the syndrome uh, by their effects on the neuroanatomy and begin to factor that disease into multiple sub-diseases, which may make it amenable to different kinds of treatments. Let's go back and not change the genetics and instead just change the environment. This is an educational experiment. This is a mouse in a water tank. All mice can swim. They don't like to swim. And this is a platform which the mouse can't see. It's just below the surface and it's slightly murky water. The mouse uh, eventually, well, we eventually stop the mouse after about two minutes. We pick him up. We put him on the platform, leave him there for a minute. And then we put him through that experiment six times a day, and we do it for five days of the week. And at the end of the week, this is what the mouse does. The reason he does that is on the walls of the room are red circle, uh, green triangle, yellow square. And when he's dropped into the swimming pool anywhere, he looks around and says, I'm going there. That's where the platform is. Just to show you that wasn't just a lucky uh, bid, is another mouse that's had training for a week. <laughs> but we took the platform out. This is a mouse model of human frustration. It's, uh... <laughs> so what happens when a mouse learns to do that? Here's the differences in neuroanatomy reflecting neuroplasticity in a mouse that learned the maze versus a, another control mouse that just has equivalent uh, exercise. And particularly, the hippocampus lights up. It's a very strong signal with a false discovery rate of one, less than 1%, and uh, is a new way to use anatomy to look at function. I think it opens a whole pile of experiments because there are lots of mouse models who can learn and can't remember, who can't learn. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of other tests that we can put them through. If we put a flag on the platform, it's a different part of the brain because they're not learning a maze. There are differences between male and female in their ability in this experiment. Uh, so from sensitive measurements and good statistical analysis, we're able to get some very interesting functional information about uh, from neuroanatomy. For those of you who are graduate students, you can see where this is going to be headed. It will be eventually necessary for you to show that the regions of your brain that are associated with the subject matter of your thesis have grown sufficiently during the course of your training. So let's go to the embryonic lethals. Uh, imaging embryonic lethals has turned out to be best done with x-ray CT. It was a surprise to me. They're soft tissue. It shouldn't show up. But if you can soak them in nonspecific iodine, you get a very nice high-resolution three-dimensional image of an embryo. For those of you not familiar with the gestation of a mouse, it goes from fertilization to birth in about 18 days. So this is sort of uh, in the beginning of the third trimester, if you like. And the phenotyping question is exactly the same here. Is this reference mouse different than one which has a mutation in? And particularly, if we know the embryo is not going to be born, we expect there to be differences, and we want to know what they are. Uh, we can make an average atlas. This is an atlas made out of 35 embryos. And then we've gone through and hand-colored it. And it's a tedious job. I mean, coloring within the lines, I thought we finished in kindergarten. But coloring within the lines in 3D really is tedious because you do all the slices nicely, and then you turn it over, and it looks like a stack of salami that's not quite registered. So you clean that up, and then it's gone in the other dimension. So people do spend a long time uh, getting these colored. But th since we can always put them in the same atlas, we can pick up the colors so we only have to do it once. There's also one other problem with looking at the developmental picture is that the developmental picture isn't static. It's changing in time. And uh, we're not able to watch embryos grow in time, but we do need, if we've taken an embryo out and we want to know whether it's normal or not, and we're comparing it with a normal, we do have to compare it with a range of ages. And we can handle that by simply taking different ages, atlases made at different ages, 
And by registering them together, we can find homologous points in pairs. And once we've done that, we can develop a trajectory and fit it with a spline. And that essentially gives us our best cut out of a hundred some embryos of a dynamic movie of development. This is a three dimensional structure. You can look at any plane in it, and uh, you can watch it grow. Uh, see it again there. It's actually quite interesting because certain organs just appear. In fact, it's hard to tell you where the lungs are going to come from. In fact, it's better to watch the movie going backwards because you can say, I see the lung and I know it disappeared, so next time we go up, I can see where it's coming from. And we think that'll be very useful for the computer to decide whether embryos are fundamentally different after genetic change or whether they're just growth delayed or even whether specific organs are growth delayed. One more, if we go to smaller embryos, CT doesn't work, MR doesn't work, the contrast disappears, the resolution's not adequate. And now we go to an optical analog of CT. We rotate the specimen by half degree intervals, we take a fluorescence image of it, we reconstruct it as if it were CT data, and we get images that look like this, which we can cut on the computer afterwards, we can get the resolution down to about three microns. This is actually an interesting rendering in that it's a sort of surface rendering, but with enough transparency that you can sort of see through it. And so you certainly get a sense that it's semi-transparent, but that's about as far as you can get with that. If you put more transparency in, it just gets cluttered and you can't see it. But it's, again, struggling with how do you represent three-dimensional data in a, in a meaningful way. If you use a fluorescence activity and do specific stains, here a PCAM stain for the vascular endothelium, uh, you get a really remarkable image, and you can make more sense of it because it's sparse. So you can see through it, and then parallax helps you. It's rotated. Uh, that cleft through the middle is, in fact, real. Uh, the vascular turd develops around the two halves, and as the neural crest closes, and if we'd waited for another six hours, that vasculature would have filled that over and begun to penetrate into the embryo. And this is a, an OPT image made by Ian Smythe at Monash. It was actually a winner in the Wellcome Trust Imaging Award. Uh, I think it's a really impressive image. Uh, one of the things I am impressed about is that he's used a different color scale than the hot metal scale we've been using, and it just looks much more biological. The greens and browns uh, feel more comfortable, and the uh, highlighting really makes the surface look wet, and you have quite a sense that you're really looking at a biological structure rather than just looking at uh, a three-dimensional matrix of numbers, which is exactly what he's working with. So in conclusion, I've, uh, I think, shown you that uh, we can do a lot with three-dimensional imaging and understanding how genes give rise to geometry. Neuroanatomical images are high quality and can be used for a variety of things. I haven't said much about vascular patterning. Uh, when you ask the question, is a vas this vascular tree the same as this one, that, I think, is still an unsolved problem because you can't use registration to put them on top of each other. And thirdly, embryogenesis is well characterized by 3D imaging, and we can use it to evaluate organ development. Leaves it only for me to thank a fairly large lab of people, a variety of skills, in imaging techniques, computer scientists, one mathematician, the people who work with mice, probably most importantly, a number of collaborators who make mice for us. There are probably 100 collaborators around the world who send us mice, and we do the imaging of them and uh, without whom we uh, wouldn't be able to get very far in this game. And to thank you for your attention.